Good morning. Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving week, everybody. Our opening words this morning are in your hymnal, either gray or with our beautiful tapestries on them. Number 512. It is a responsive opening reading. Give you a second to open up your hymnals. Number 512. It's near the back. Yes, 512. Thank you. I invite you to read the italicized response. For the expanding grandeur of creation, worlds known and unknown, galaxies beyond galaxies, filling us with awe and challenging our imaginations. For this fragile planet Earth, its times and tides, its sunsets and seasons. For the joy of human life, its wonders and surprises, its hopes and achievements. For our human community, our common past and future hope, our oneness transcending all separation, our capacity to work for peace and justice in the midst of hostility and oppression, for high hopes and noble causes, for faith without fanaticism, for understanding of views not shared. For all who have labored and suffered for a fairer world, who have lived so that others might live in dignity and freedom. For human liberty and sacred rights, for opportunities to change and grow, to affirm and choose. Deeds, but by our deeds. And I just realized that our folks on Zoom might not have heard that last piece. We give thanks this day. We pray that we may live not by our fears, but by our hopes not by our words, but by our deeds. And I now invite Willie Hall to come up and light our chalice. And I invite you to help light the chalice by saying, 
Be thankful. And I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit and sing our opening hymn. We sing now together number 67. So welcome to First Parish in Bedford, a Unitarian Universalist congregation where people have been gathering for almost 300 years to further the spirit of liberal religion. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whether you worship one God, many gods, or no God, you are welcome here and we are delighted that you chose to be with us on this beautiful Sunday morning. I want to give a special welcome to our visitors this morning here in person and on Zoom. We're so glad you're with us. Here in the sanctuary, you can fill out one of the blue connection cards that you will find somewhere on your pew, towards the end of the pew, I believe. If you fill it out, we will add you to our newsletter so you can stay in touch and know about what's going on here. Uh, please place the blue card in the offering bag when the ushers come around later in the service to take the offering. You can also scan one of the QR codes on the back of the pew and fill out a digital connection card that way. Uh, after the service, we hope you will stop by the welcome table and say hello. Someone will be happy to answer your questions about the church. On Zoom, we'll put a link to a form you can fill out a virtual connection card on Zoom. Parents and caregivers of little ones, there is a nursery available downstairs for your convenience, but we are always delighted to have our little uh, ones here in the sanctuary with us as well. Everyone is invited to join us after the service for uh, fellowship, coffee, and tea in the common room. And we're happy to announce that starting today, uh, we are also opening up a second space upstairs in room 201 that is intended to be more of a space for um, quiet conversation and connection, recognizing that the bustle of the common room can be a lot uh, and it doesn't work for everyone. And so if you need a quieter space to uh, rest and connect, 
more one-on-one. -on -one. That will be room 201 upstairs. There will be coffee service in the kitchen that is connected, so you do not need to like bring your coffee upstairs with you. It will already be there. And huge thanks to the hospitality team for making that happen. Yes. <laughs> Two additional announcements this morning. Apparently I'm doing finger guns today. Two additional announcements this morning. Just after service today at 11.15, we will have a climate cafe to bring people up to date on the formation of a Third Act Massachusetts working group. Third Act is building a community of Americans over the age of 60 determined to change the world for the better, using their life experience, their skills, and their resources to build a better tomorrow. We'll describe our project teams, the ways that you can join this work, the ways that many of you are already doing this work, so please grab some coffee and enjoy the Environmental Justice Committee in the Bacon Room for this in-person event. Again, 11.15 after the service. And finally, New Member Sunday is coming. Uh, December 10th, we will have a time in the service to recognize and honor our new members. We do this a couple of times throughout the year. So if you have been a part of the First Parish community for a while now, but you're not a member and think you're thinking, maybe this is a good time to sign the book and make it official, please reach out to me or to Reverend Annie. We would love to chat about that and we would love to be able to recognize you during that service. So those are all of our announcements today. If you would please rise once again, we will share our unison affirmation, which is in your order of service. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia, y el servicio es su ley. Este es nuestro gran pacto, vivir juntos un paz, Buscar la verdad en espíritu de amor y ayudarnos los unos a los otros. Please be seated. We have a story for you this morning. Imagine a land far from this one and a time much different than our own. Imagine that you are the village elder who owns many fields and stables full of livestock. Imagine that your harvest this year has been the most successful ever and that you're grateful to the powers that be in the universe for this bounty. And in this story this morning, you'll see and hear this village elder who has their own idea about how to celebrate. And you'll meet the council members of their village and you'll hear how they taught their village an embarrassing but important lesson. Because who doesn't like an embarrassing lesson, right? So in this land far away, in that time so different from ours, it had been a glorious harvest year for the village elder, the richest person in the valley. They were grateful for their many fields of grain and for stables full of livestock. As an expression of gratitude, they decided to share their riches with all of the people of the valley. They would hold a feast for all of the neighbors. But the elder needed help with one aspect of the feast. To get that help and to issue the invitation to the feast, they called the Council of Elders together. I have had a great harvest this year, and my stables are full of livestock. There is much to be thankful for, and so I shall hold a great feast for all the people of this valley. I will provide the food, I will provide the musicians and the jugglers, I will provide the space for this feast. I will do all of this if you will provide the juice. Of course, of course. We shall bring each one jug of juice and pour them into a common vessel. Thus, we shall share, even as we partake of your generosity. Very formal council members, clearly. And with that, the council members returned to their homes, dreaming of the great feast to come. 
As soon as they had parted, however, the youngest was already cursing himself for having agreed to part with one whole jug of juice. He didn't have much juice in his stores, and he didn't want to spend money. He returned to his wife, and they sat down to discuss the problem. An entire jug of juice? Are we to give up so much when we don't have as much as others? There must be another way. Suddenly, his wife had an idea. My dear, the other four elders will pour their juice into the common pot. Is that not so? Could one small jug of water, water really spoil so much juice? Hardly so, my clever wife. What a plan. This way we will keep our juice for ourselves. Clever wife indeed. While the youngest council member and his wife had been crafting their plan, the people in their valley had received the invitation to the feast with great anticipation. Finally, the evening of the feast had arrived. As the villagers dressed in their finest clothes, did, so did the youngest council member. And then, as planned, he secretly filled the jug with fresh water from the well. The council member and his wife carried their jug to the party, meeting the other council members and all the townspeople along the way. And when they arrived at the estate of the village elder, everyone was greeted by the sound of music playing and the delicious smells of food cooking. Welcome to this great feast. Thank you for bringing your juice. You may pour the jugs into that great stainless steel pot in the courtyard <laughs> and then take your fill of food. We all know that granite ware makes the best pots for our juice, come on. And so all the village council members came forward and poured their juice from their pitchers into the large granite ware roasting pan of, <laughs> of juice. And it was a wonderful feast that they had. First, there was dancing and entertainment, and then the bell was rung and the guests were seated. And as they had all poured their juice into the common pot, and everyone's cups were now filled from the common pot, everyone was anxious to taste this wonderful melange of juice. Before we share this meal and drink this juice, let us give thanks. We give thanks for the work of the earth and the sun as they ripened the fruits of the earth to fill our bellies. We give thanks for the hands that have prepared this food so that we might eat it. We give thanks for the company gathered here, all those who make our village a place of abundance, especially by bringing their gifts to share with us in generosity. The crowd had gathered, the food had been served, and thanks had been given. Finally, it was time to eat and drink. After the village elder's blessing, every guest at the feast lifted their cup and brought the cup to their lips, and they sipped. And they sipped again. But something was wrong. What they tasted was not a wonderful melange of apple and orange and grape juice, but it was simple water. One jug of water cannot spoil a great pot of juice. So we told ourselves, and so we filled our jug at the well. But clearly, every council member had done the same thought. Each of them filled his or her jug at the well. And so instead of sharing our juice to suit this great occasion, we have done nothing but embarrass ourselves. All the council members looked at each other a little sheepishly, avoiding the eyes of the village elder, and then continued to drink as though it was the finest juice in all of the land. <laughs> the next day, a new saying arose among the people of the town, a saying that spread around the world. If you wish to take juice, you must give it also. Thank you to our cast of characters. Like in our story, the table that we are able to set for one another is dependent on what we all collectively bring to it. The free church depends on the gifts of its members for all that it is and does. 
The table that we are setting here is an open table and everyone is invited. So the gifts we bring to the common table are not just for ourselves or for our friends or even for this present circle of community. But we're also setting the table for the guests who may be coming here for the first time next Sunday, who is hungry for something, maybe they can't even name what it is exactly, and maybe we are exactly the place where they are going to be fed. And we're setting the table for the person who we don't know yet who will walk through these doors a year from now. And we're setting the table for people who we may never meet, people who will be a part of this community 30 years from now or 50 years from now. We hope what we are creating here is a party that never ends, a perpetual feast of wisdom and hope and inspiration, fellowship and service, all these good things that we create when we bring our gifts to the common table, including our financial gifts, which look like something different for each of us, but we all have a part to play in setting the table and everyone's gift is important. We're going to take an offering now. Please give generously and joyfully, and let's keep this party going. Thank you so much to Natan and our youth musicians. Let's give them another note of appreciation. You all were amazing today. Thank you so much. I want to lift up uh, this community of, of uh, excuse me, of generosity um, and appreciation. 
And so often our generosity and our gratitude go hand in hand. It is when we feel most full that we are able to give most freely. So on this uh, day of Thanksgiving, I'd like us to just take a moment. I'm going to invite you to take a moment and just take a breath and center yourself. And let's just take a moment to think of things that we are thankful for. So I just invite you, name for yourself something that you are thankful for in the world right now, large or small. It could be family. It could be the cup of coffee that you drank this morning when you got up. Whatever it is, take a moment and be thankful. And if you're moved to say that out loud into this space, you're welcome to do so, but you can also just think it to yourself. Ultimately, our abundance is a gift of the earth. And so I want to share a prayer from the Tewa Indians of North America, which is a prayer of thanksgiving for the earth, which nurtures and sustains us. O oh, our mother, the earth, O oh, our father, the sky, your children are we, and with tired backs we bring you the gifts you love. Weave for us a garment of brightness, May the warp be the white light of morning. May the weft be the red light of evening. May the fringes be the falling rain. May the border be the standing rainbow. Thus weave for us a garment of brightness that we may walk fittingly where birds sing, that we may walk fittingly where grass is green. O oh, our mother the earth, O oh, our father the sky. So let us include every day in our gratitudes, our, thank, our thankfulness for the earth. And I also want to thank so much Lisa Maria and our children and youth for bringing us our story today, uh, which is a retelling of a traditional folk tale in which members of a village, council members of a village are asked to bring uh, juice to a communal feast and each thinks to themselves, if I bring water instead of juice, what can it possibly matter? How can the withholding of my own gift make a difference? And all of the council members have the same thoughts. And so no one brings juice and there is only water and it turns out to matter a great deal. Each councilor is left to feel embarrassed. Everyone goes without. And like most folk tales, there is a wisdom at the heart of this story, which is that generosity matters. We each have something to give and a community does not prosper when people choose not to share their gifts for whatever reason. But now, what if we also challenge the text a little bit? What if we dig a little deeper into this story and ask some different kinds of questions about it? Because the best stories allow us to ask all kinds of different questions about them and imagine different answers. So when Lisa Maria and I were preparing for this service and talking about this story, we were also thinking about our UU value of equity that we're exploring this month. Equity, we said last week, you may remember, is different than equality. Equality is treating everyone the same, like, for example, saying, I want each one of you members of the village council to bring a jug of juice to the party just the same. Equity says maybe sometimes we need to treat people differently if we're all going to flourish together. And our story today is not a story of flourishing, is it? It's really kind of a bummer, right? Nobody brings the drinks. The party is a bust. People are probably mad or at least disappointed. The counselors are left feeling embarrassed and ashamed, which is a bad way to feel. So this is a bad outcome. And a lot of times when a group of people try to do a thing together and there's a bad outcome, this is how that goes, right? Some people are mad, some people are ashamed, and the community as a whole feels like we failed at something we tried to do that's pretty embarrassing. Let's never speak of this again, but also let's secretly remember it until the end of time. <laughs> But 
When a group of basically decent people don't succeed at a thing, that's also a good time to ask some curious questions about how that came to be. And the answer is usually more helpful than just, well, sometimes people do bad things. So Lisa, Maria, and I started asking some questions about this story because we were thinking about that equity value. Because the story begins with the village, el village elder saying to the counselors, each of you bring a jug of juice to the party, it's natural to ask, why did the village elder think that each person had a jug of juice, which in the context of this story would have been quite an expensive thing to part with, why did the village elder think that each person could afford to give that? The story tells us that all of the families had different means. We know that one family couldn't really afford it. So why did the village elder assume that everyone could? And why did nobody in the group think to ask the question, hey, is this going to work for everyone? Sometimes the story a community has about itself is that all of us here are pretty well off. Or at least no one is struggling. Surely no one here could be struggling. And so it's natural to ask, was there a place in this community for people who didn't have a lot to spare? Were they seen and appreciated, or were they a little invisible? So you can say the problem in the story is that no one brought juice to the party, but an earlier problem in the story was that no one thought to ask, does everyone have juice to give? And meanwhile, no one was imagining that the person standing next to them, their neighbor, their coworker, their friend, might have different means or circumstances than themselves. So, now when the elder asks the counselors to bring the expensive gift, everyone says, yeah, you bet, no problem, happy to. But for at least one of the counselors, we know he's not happy at all. Because actually, this is a lot to ask of his family but they've all been put on the spot, right? So how hard would it have been to say in front of this whole group of colleagues, actually, my family can't really afford to bring that, right? That's a big gift and we don't have it. Maybe that would have been a pretty hard thing to say, right? Maybe that was just too hard of a thing to say in front of all these people. Now, should it be a hard thing to say? What does it mean that it often is a really hard thing for people to say? So you can say the problem in the story is that no one brought the drinks to the party, but you can also say even before that, there was a problem that it was easier for everyone in the story to secretly fake bringing the drinks, which can't have felt very good, honestly, than just to say, hey, I need this to happen differently. This isn't going to work for me. Can we think of something else? Even before we get to the part of the story where people are sneaking around, already no one felt like they could be real with each other. And so in the end, they weren't. Now from the story itself, we don't really know why all of the counselors brought water to the party instead of juice. We only know why the one counselor did it. And so we can ask, was it the case that none of the counselors really could afford the juice? That seems doubtful. The one counselor we do know about, it's not just that it's a lot for him to give. He's also resentful that he thinks he's being asked to give more than the others. He's resentful that he thinks the people around him aren't giving as much. So he's already kind of operating from that equality mindset. He's looking at what everyone else is giving and he's trying to judge, am I being asked to give more? So even before we get to the part in the story where people are sneaking around, there doesn't seem to be a lot of trust and a lot of generosity in this community, right? People are jealous of their neighbors and maybe that is a way bigger problem than there being no drinks at the party at the end of the day. Now here is another question we might want to ask. Was anyone excited to bring juice to the party to begin with? Right? They didn't get to choose what gift they were going to bring. It was kind of decided for them. Were any of them excited about bringing that gift? Were they invested in giving that gift? Because the one family that we know about, what they thought was, our gift doesn't really matter. 
Right? It won't be missed. The story presents it like they kind of thought they were getting away with something, but what else were they feeling? Right? How did they come to believe this community doesn't really need what we have to offer? And how did it feel to believe that? So how might this story have turned out differently if they had approached the whole situation differently right from the very beginning? Not asking every person to bring the same thing, but asking instead, what gift or gifts do you have to bring? And what gift or gifts would you be excited to bring? Right? Is there a gift that is uniquely yours to bring? The invitation to generosity can be a powerful and an empowering thing. Right? If we start from the assumption that everyone has something to give because everyone already is a gift, everyone already is a gift to the community, and the expression of that gift is naturally going to look different for every person, right? In the case of this party, maybe that's one person brings the drinks, Someone else makes a killer Spotify playlist. Someone has party games. Someone is really great at getting people out onto the dance floor, right? And someone's got to bring the compostable plates, sure, right? Once people are excited by the spirit of generosity and possibility, those kinds of details tend to take care of themselves. But anyway, this isn't really a story about party planning, right? So please, don't let your takeaway be that uh, Jamie says all future church events should unfold in the spirit of mad anarchy. Because that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is what if the real sadness of this party is not that no one brought the juice, but that no one was excited about what they were bringing at all. And no one thought that their gift mattered. And no one had the opportunity to get creative and bring the thing that was workable for them and joyful for them and that was their thing uniquely to do. They didn't trust that their neighbor would do the same and that if they all did that, it would work out okay and better than okay. They didn't see themselves as a gift. They didn't see their neighbor as a gift. And so they never got to see all of the gifts that they could have had together as a community. And they never got to see what they could create out of that abundance of unique giving. They just saw through the lens of their fear and their jealousy, and they all ended up with a bummer of a party. It doesn't even say if there was a Spotify playlist, so how good could it have been? So what if we imagine a different kind of party where we trust that everyone has something to bring to the feast and where everyone is invited to bring the thing that is joyful and workable for them. From the place of our joy and our generosity and from the richness of our many and diverse offerings, can we build something that people will still be talking about years later where they are remembering the laughter and the fellowship and the spirit of warmth and caring and inclusion? They are remembering that people thought I mattered. They are remembering that I had something to give and it was honored long after everyone's forgotten about the drinks and who brought what and whether there was any at all. Remembering instead that they built a spirit of community together and that was what was truly worth celebrating. Can we imagine that party and can we build it together? Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 318 in your cloth bound hymnal. We would be one. Please rise in body or spirit.
May we go from this place grateful for all, for all that we are, all that we have, and all that we share. May you know that you are a blessing, and may you be blessed. Until we meet again, go in peace.